Okay, we are in AP, AB, and BC Calculus doing Unit 1, Section 1 uh, from the College Board Curriculum, which is Introducing Calculus Can Change Occur at an Instant. So essentially what we're going to discuss briefly in this video is uh, the ways that calculus changes the world of calculation as we know it. It allows us to find instantaneous things when using math before calculus only allowed us to find average values. Um, we're going to specifically interpret some uh, rates of change at a particular instant uh, approximately by using uh, average rates of change over an interval containing a particular instant. We're going to do a few examples of that. So let's first walk through uh, a couple of slides that just show you what you can do with calculus versus what you were able to do before calculus. So without calculus, we're able to find a y value on a graph, right? If I input x is c, I'm able to find the y value f of c, right? Um, but now with calculus, what we're going to be able to do is even if my function is undefined at a point, you see that little open circle there, I'm able to approximate what y value the function is approaching using a concept called limits, which we're going to work on a lot in this unit. Um, before calculus, we were able to find the slope of a line. Now that we have calculus, we're going to be able to find the slope of a curve, which is pretty awesome. Um, before calculus, we could find the slope of a line that is secant to a curve, right? So uh, where it touches the curve at two points. Now we're going to be able to find the tangent line to a curve, which is really fun in like a physics application sense, because if you were like in a roller coaster, like, whee, you're on a roller coaster and the roller coaster actually breaks, uh, if you were to fly off that roller coaster, you would be flying off at a line tangential to the curve, which is pretty cool. Um, not that I would suggest you fly off of a roller coaster. Please don't. It's a terrible life choice. Anyway. Uh, without calculus, we can find the average rate of uh, change between two times of a car, meaning that you could find the average speed over an entire trip. But with differential calculus, we're going to be able to find the instantaneous speed of a car or velocity if we're talking about a direction mattering. But again, we can find how fast you're actually going in an instant as opposed to an average over time. Uh, Without calculus, we can find the curvature of a circle, but with calculus, we can actually find the curvature of a curve, right? Like a different shape that is not just a, a simple geometric shape that we're used to. Without calculus, uh, we can find a, a height of a curve at C, meaning we can find a Y value, right, at C, uh, which is similar to the first thing I mentioned, right, finding F of C. But with calculus, we can actually find the maximum height on a particular interval, and we're going to talk about how to do that. And obviously, some of these are things that you may have been able to do with a calculator that you couldn't do by hand. Uh, without calculus, we can, we can find a plane that is tangential to a sphere, but with calculus, we can find a plane that is tangential to any surface, right? Uh, which has a lot of applications in science and engineering. Without calculus, uh, we can talk about the direction of motion along a line, but now with calculus, we're going to be able to talk about the direction of motion along a curve, right? So again, something like a roller coaster as opposed to just driving on a straight road. Cool. So the first half of calculus, which is called differential calculus, the second half of what you're going to learn is integral calculus. Differential calculus is largely based on a question about tangent lines, right? So we had tangent lines right here, right? Secant line versus tangent line. So the first half of calculus, differential calculus, is based on a question about a tangent line. So let's look at what a secant and a tangent line are real quick. So the tangent line problem is kind of a big deal, and I've used one notation here. I'm going to show you another similar notation. So here's the idea with a tangent line. We have some point C, right? So there's a spot C, and then the y value would be f of C, right? C comma f of C. If we wanted to find the slope of the tangent line at C, the problem is that right now we can't, because right now we can only find slope using two points, right? If you think about what slope is, right? Old school algebra, our slope is y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1, right? And notice that that requires two points. They can't be the same point because if they were the same x value, you'd be dividing by zero, which we know we're not supposed to do. So what you do is you pick another point somewhere else on the curve and you approximate the tangent line. The closer the point gets to the original c, so here's my point c, right? The closer my point gets to C, the more accurate the secant line approximation is to the tangent line, right? The tangent line that touches only at that point P as they labeled on this diagram. So another way you'll see this, so here what they did is they used the point, uh, they used P as C comma F of C. Sorry, that's not the letter C. Okay, cool. Um, and, then, and then they used Q where they just moved delta X over. So they used a different point Q where the X coordinate was C plus that change in X, right? And that would make your y coordinate f of c plus that change in x. And that's fine, right? So that's, that's one way to do it. 
another way that we're going to see it in calculus, right? Uh, so this would this would give me the secant line, m secant. You can see this is m s e c m secant. Uh, another way you'll see it sometimes is sometimes this is is called an h, right? Um, instead of using delta x, they'll use the letter h. Sometimes instead of using c and f of c, uh, sometimes you'll see this as x and f of x, and then the q point is sometimes uh, x plus h, and the y value would be f of the quantity x plus h. So that's the same idea, but again, it's a secant line. So, so this is the equation of the secant line. What we're going to learn to do with calculus is we're going to learn to find the equation uh, and the slope specifically, which will then lead us to the equation of this tangent line, which again only has one point. The problem is that if you only use one point, the two x's would be the same, and that would be zero. You can't divide by zero. So that's where we're headed with this. We're going to do the tangent line problem eventually, but that's really what the first half of differential calculus is built on. So let's go ahead and talk a little bit about uh, some examples using average rate of change to approximate instantaneous rate of change. Cool. So Hogan loads the fam in the Subaru uh, to go on a road trip at noon. Her distance from South Philly, because she's starting in South Philly at certain times, is given in the table below. So at noon, right, time since noon is uh, zero hours, so that's at noon, right? This is noon. This would be 1 p.m. This would be 2 p.m. This would be 3 p.m., 4 p.m. and 5 p.m., right? They're going on a, an epic afternoon road trip, right? So at noon, I'm in South Philly. My distance from South Philly is zero. One hour later, 25 miles from South Philly, which means that the traffic was fairly kind because yikes, traffic in Philly, right? Uh, at two, I'm a total of 90 miles from Philly. Uh, at three, I'm a total of 140 miles from South Philly. At four, 200 miles from South Philly. And at five hours, 265 miles. So the first question is, what's the average speed of the car during the trip? Now, since this entire time, we're just talking about uh, my distance from, like this isn't displacement, it doesn't have a direction, this is just distance. So essentially, if you think back to like maybe third grade, right? Um, if I do distance divided by time, that's gonna be my speed, right? So my speed, right, my average speed over that time is gonna be the change in distance, right, over the change in time. So uh, my change in distance was 265 minus zero, right, because I went 265 miles, and the change in time was five hours, right? So I'm going to get 265 divided by 5, uh, which is, I don't know, sometimes my brain dies. 265, that's not a 5. Cool, 53. So 53 miles per hour. So my average speed on the whole trip was about 53 miles an hour, which makes sense because there were some really slow spots in Philly where I was in a lot of traffic or where I was on a small road. And then when I got onto highways, I was probably driving 60 to 70 miles an hour and that would, it would counterbalance a little bit. Okay, using two points on the table, estimate the speed at 1230. Well, 1230 is gonna fall right here, right? 1230 is gonna fall between these two. So I'm gonna use these two points and I'm gonna go ahead and say that the speed at 1230 is approximately, and then I'm just gonna do the same thing, change in distance over change in time. So 25 minus zero over one minus zero, which would be 25 miles per hour. Now the reason it's an estimate is because I'm not driving 25 miles an hour the entire time, that's, that's mathematically impossible, right? You don't jump in a car and it instantly starts moving 25 miles an hour, it has to accelerate and decelerate. Plus I'm driving in a city, so I'm gonna be going faster at some points and slower at some points because of stop signs and, and traffic lights and whatnot. Okay, so that's my, my average speed, right? So it's my, my average, uh, that's my average speed, but in using it to approximate the speed at an instant, right? So this is an average from noon to 1 p.m. I'm using it to approximate the instantaneous speed. Again, we'll be able to find instantaneous uh, velocity, instantaneous speed once we have calculus. The next question, using two points on the table, Estimate the speed at 3.30 p.m. Well, 3.30 falls right here, so the two logical points to use are going to be 3 and 4 p.m. So my speed at 3.30 p.m. is going to be approximately 200 minus 140 over 4 minus 3. So that's going to be 60 miles per hour. Notice that I am putting units. If there are units, I need to make sure I have them. It makes sense that it's miles per hour because the top number is a change in miles and the bottom number is a change in hours, right? It also makes sense logically for most of us because we're talking about driving. Okay, so part uh, the next part, why is an estimate based on the start and end time uh, 
and distance not accurate to indicate the speed at which a car is actually driving. So this is more of just a like logistical, uh, what issues would cause a speed to be sort of deceptive if you just use the start and end time. So we have a toddler, a really logical explanation for this uh, is, you know, it might, so, so as an example, right, uh, I might look like I'm driving 20 miles an hour, right? Because maybe I only go 40 miles in two hours, but maybe the reason for that is because somewhere in our, in the middle of hour one to two, we had to stop for a crazy diaper issue or we had to stop to walk the senior dog or whatever, right? So realistically, when people take road trips, uh, they take stops at rest areas. They don't always go, they're not driving constantly, they're not driving straight through. So if you only look at the start and end time, it's deceptive because it can look like you were going really slow when actually you weren't. So a really common example of this is if you think about a turnpike, right? Uh, you drive through the turnpike thing, you either pay by cash or you pay on easy pass. So let's say that I drive on the turnpike for, I don't know, let's say 200 miles, right? And maybe I do those 200 miles in five hours, right? So maybe when I log into my easy pass on and off the turnpike, maybe I went 200. So as an example, let's say I went 200 miles in five hours. Well, you might say, oh, that's great, Hogan. You totally weren't speeding. You were probably going way below the speed limit. You were only going 40 miles an hour. But the speed limit on the turnpike is probably 70 miles an hour. So why is it that I went so much slower? Well, maybe I didn't, right? Maybe I was driving for five hours. I have a senior dog. I have a toddler. And so maybe somewhere in there we had to stop for lunch. We had to stop for a nap. We had to stop for something. So what average speed doesn't take into account is that at any given moment, other stuff's going on. Maybe I was driving way too fast the rest of the trip, but we stopped for an hour and a half, right? Um, so that's the part that that average wouldn't take into account. So again, with calculus, we'll be able to find instantaneous velocity, instantaneous speed, um, which is going to give us a lot more freedom when we're doing problems involving physics and engineering and other stuff. All right. Example two, the table below gives some values for f of x. f of x is x cubed, okay? So what we're going to do is we're going to calculate the slope of the secant line between two points on this table over and over and over again, and we'll use the calculator to help us. And then based on that, when we get to f, we're going to go ahead and see what we can approximate the tangent line slope would be. So we're going to start by using the first point and the last point, right? So my secant slope, and I'm just gonna call it ms, right? My secant slope would be y minus the y value over x minus the x value, right? Uh, and I should get that that is a 19. Okay, so I get a slope of 19. But then I'm gonna go ahead and use uh, the same first point, right? And the 2.5. So now my secant slope is gonna be 2.5 minus, what did I, come on brain, I reversed it, just ignore me for a sec, sometimes my brain's slow. All right, sorry, uh, the 15.625 minus the 8 over the 2.5 minus the 2. Now I don't really feel like doing that by hand, so I'm going to go ahead and uh, bring this guy over here for a sec. All right, cool. So uh, let's do 15.625 minus eight. And then I'm going to go ahead and just divide by 0.5 because I can do that bottom in my head and I get a 15.25. So 15.25 is the slope as I move a little closer. Okay, so now let's, let's move a little bit closer and use the 2.1 again, still with the first point. So I'm going to get that my secant slope for the next one is going to be a 9.261 minus eight over a 2.1 minus two. So let's go back to our calculator, right? So we'll do 9.261 minus 8 divided by 0.1 gives me a 12.61, right? Uh, let's go ahead and do the next one. So now I'm using that 2.01 and still using that first point. So my secant slope for the next one is going to be 8. 0.120601, I gave you lots of places there, minus 8 over a 2.01 minus 2, right? Um, so let's go ahead and type that one in, right? So uh, 8.120601 uh, minus 8 divided by 0 0.01, all right? So I get that this is a 12 point, I think it was an 061, sometimes my brain is, yes, 0601, 0601, cool, okay. All right, now let's loop back around to, uh, I'm going to use black for this one. So we use last one here. So my secant slope for this one should be this ridiculously large number, 
0, 1, 2, 0, 0, 6, 0, 0, 1, minus 8 over 2.001 0, 0, minus 2. So 8.012006001 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, minus 8 divided by 0, 0, 0.001. Okay, I get 12.006001. Okay. So now the question was, based on these, what number do we think that the tangent slope is going to have, right? So if you look at how this data is trending, it becomes pretty clear that as I get closer and closer and closer, this seems to be trending to a 12. So I, my guess is that the tangent slope is a 12, right? And I can confirm using calculus that that's right. Now, you don't know how to differentiate yet, but when you do know how to differentiate, I can assure you that if my function is x cubed, my derivative, and we're going to learn how to do this later, I promise, is 3x squared. And my tangent slope would be the derivative at that point, which would be 3 times a 2 squared. That's a 3 times a 4, which is absolutely a 12. So now, would I have shown all this work to get 12? No, I would have gotten 12 in my head, and you'll get there too. But so, so you don't know how to do this yet. This is, this is later, right? Later on in this course, you're going to learn how to differentiate, and we're going to be able to find that the tangent slope is, in fact, a 12. Uh, but for right now, we're just going to uh, settle for what we know how to do, which is how to approximate uh, an instantaneous slope using an average slope. It is very likely on your AP Calc exam that you're going to have to approximate a slope, just like we did here. So instead, I didn't find the tangent slope here. I found all of these secant line slopes, right? To approximate a tangent slope and it's very likely that you're going to be asked to use a table and approximate a slope of some kind using a table just like we did here several times and just like we did on this problem several times where we approximated that rate of change. So that's it for our first video.